thanks everyone for joining us here today. Um, I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging um, our first scientists uh, and the traditional custodians of, of the land that we're all on. We're streaming from the lands of the Wurundjeri people. And so I wanna pay my uh, respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I wanna particularly welcome any uh, First Nations folk who are joining us today. Uh, so welcome everyone to our uh, midsummer lecture on neurodiversity. Uh, I'm Sarah Gordon, I'm co-chair of Queers in Science Victoria, uh, and I'm also a lab head uh, at the Flory Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health, um, where my team work on childhood neurological disorders. Uh, so I normally start off my slides with a picture like this, which is um, uh, brain cells under a microscope. Um, I thought I'd try and be on theme today um, because this is our, our midsummer lecture. Uh, so I want to thank all of the partners that have helped us um, in putting this uh, lecture uh, together. So uh, Queers in Science uh, and the Flory, um, Midsummer Festival, the Royal Society of Victoria and Inspiring Australia, Victoria. So I'm going to uh, start us off by... Um, giving us a framework for what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so people uh, experience, uh, interact with and interpret the world in unique ways. So neurodiversity is a term that reflects our understanding that people learn and think uh, in different ways and that brain differences are normal. So, you know, we know that, uh, that no two brains are the same. So given this, it's not really surprising that people experience the world in different ways and interpret uh, uh, the world differently. So I just want to give a bit of uh, uh, sort of an, a note about our language use today. So this is a really uh, dynamic, um, fast evolving field. And so there's no one standard in the community with regards to the language uh, surrounding neurodiversity. Um, at times, there are differences between the terminology used in the research world uh, and that used within the, the community. So we're gonna be trying to use a community sort of centric uh, language today. Um, but just letting you know that we might sort of um, change that around uh, with different um, speakers today. So what do we mean uh, by the term uh, neurodivergence? So neurodivergent people are those whose brains think differently from the way the majority expect, or that's, that's sort of typical in society. So for example, this might include people with autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, um, but it definitely goes beyond that. And in fact, uh, if you don't consider yourself neurotypical, you can consider yourself neurodivergent. So neurotypical people, in contrast, are those whose brains function in the way that's considered uh, standard or sort of the typical for the majority of society. Uh, Autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, and other forms of neurodivergence um, may be considered disorders or disabilities, um, but this isn't true for all. Some neurodivergent people may not see this as, as the case. Uh, and in, in any case, um, neurodivergent people may have different accessibility needs, and that's because society has been kind of set up for neurotypical folk. So uh, in today's uh, lecture, we're going to be uh, talking about what drives neurodiversity, how this is encoded within the brain, and how do we study this? So I'll be kicking us off by talking about um, how everybody's molecular code uh, contributes to neurodiversity. We'll then have uh, Liam Layden, who's doing a PhD at the Flory, um, he'll be talking about um, how neural circuits uh, contribute to neurodiversity. Uh, this will be followed by Kate Huckstep, who's also doing a PhD, 
Kate's going to be talking about um, how behaviour uh, can provide a readout of neurodiversity. And then we're going to have Dr Emma Burrows, uh, who's a lab head here at the Flory, and she's going to be talking about her work on autism. And finally, we're really, really fortunate today to be joined by Dr Sophia France and Dr Daphne Cohen, uh, and they'll be um, with us for a panel discussion talking about uh, lived experience of uh, neurodivergence. So as I said, I'm going to kick us off by talking about um, how our molecular code contributes to uh, neurodiversity. So the genetic architecture of each uh, individual person differs, right? So we know that, um, that this is, is contributed not just by the um, variants of each gene that you happen to inhab uh, inherit from your parents, um, but it's also governed by your life experience. So uh, in a process known as epigenetics, uh, the environment is able to um, modify your genetic architecture in a process of sort of molecular tuning. And so what this does is turn uh, genes uh, on, off, or up and down. Uh, and collectively, what this means is that um, even for people who share, you know, the exact same uh, genes, say identical twins, uh, their genetic architecture is unique. So genes are the blueprints to make proteins. And it's the proteins that are the machinery of our cells. Um, so it's, it's actually not that dissimilar from Lego, actually. So the genes are sort of the instructions that tell us how to put together um, particular blocks, the amino acids, in order to make proteins. And the proteins do things, right? Uh, and so, you know, sort of similarly to, to Lego, you've got a limited number of blocks available, but you put them together in different combinations um, to produce different proteins. And so each gene encodes a unique protein. So when you turn a gene on, off, or up and down, that changes the amount of protein that is available. So uh, this can change sort of throughout a lifetime. You might produce more or less of a particular protein. It can also change where that protein is expressed or located. So, you know, it might uh, uh, originally be expressed in one particular cell and then is expressed in another. So uh, each uh, person has this unique sort of uh, combination of factors that, that uh, change their genetic architecture. And you change the gene and you change the protein, right? So, you know, in a simple case, it might uh, lead to a pretty superficial kind of change. You know, as an example here, it might change the colour of a car, right? Um, but it can also have a more wide-ranging effect and it can change the properties of a protein. So, for example, it might make a protein work a little faster or a little slower uh, and might change how efficiently a protein works. Uh, it might make that protein more susceptible to breakdown and so you've got to uh, replace uh, parts more often. Or you can have more major changes, which might uh, affect how a protein functions at a really kind of um, basic sort of level. So these sorts of different variations are happening to, you know, all genes in the human body, and that leads to us all having unique molecular signatures. And these molecular signatures change the way brain cells are able to communicate with each other. So the brain is essentially a communication hub. It takes in information from the outside environment 
processes that information and then causes us to respond to our environment in an appropriate way. So this occurs through uh, brain cells, neurons, uh, talking to each other. So this is sort of an, an art, a artist sort of a rendition of uh, two neurons uh, talking to each other. Um, this is what it looks like in reality. So these are neurons underneath the microscope and you can see just how complex these networks are, right? So how complex um, uh, these interactions between individual neurons are. And at each of these connection points, um, you have one neuron communicating with another, and this is called a synapse. So this is the smallest functional unit of our brain. Um, and uh, the communication at synapses, so the communication of one neuron to another, is absolutely essential for the brain to function properly. So proteins are localized within synapses um, and every synapse is different. So you might have you know, a particular subset of proteins um, that are being expressed within um, uh, a person's sort of lifetime. And then uh, with experience, the expression of those proteins change. So you might decide that one protein isn't so important anymore and replace it with another. So this changes as your uh, interaction with your environment uh, changes. So you have trillions of synapses. All of those synapses are unique and all of them change with your lifetime of experience. So in fact, it's not really surprising that we have so much neurodiversity. So at the molecular level, every brain is entirely unique. And so we must perceive and interact with our environment in unique ways. So how do we look at this sort of stuff in the lab? Well, we can uh, sequence a person's genome we can look at the specific epigenetic signatures that every individual can have. Um, and we can look at their unique protein profiles, not just at a whole person level or a whole brain level or even a whole sort of cell level. We can look at this down at a single sort of synaptic level, right? So, um, so this allows us to get right in and start to unpick the complexity um, that, that contributes to neurodiversity. So uh, from here, uh, we're going to have uh, Liam Layden, who's going to be uh, talking about how synapses function together in neural networks. So uh, Liam is a PhD student uh, at the Flory. Uh, so Liam's uh, interested in uh, using uh, microscopy, and this is high-level uh, microscopy, um, to try and understand uh, the mechanisms underlying uh, learning and memory. Thanks, Liam. I'm Liam. I'm doing a PhD in the Neural Networks Lab here at the Flurry Institute primarily focusing on involved uh, with working memory tasks. And he had to give a brief introduction into this area of neural networks and neural activity. I'd first like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of elders past and present on which this meeting takes place and any of the community joining us here tonight. So what is a neural network? It is a network of single interconnected neurons, like this large pyramidal neuron firing action potentials down its axon, its long arm, and communicating with other neurons via synapses between them, highlighted in yellow, and to other discrete regions in the brain, and with an adapt with each with an adaptive role in processing information. The strength, number, and connectivity of these synaptic connections varies neuron to neuron, region to region, and person to person, brought about by genetics, epigenetics, and adaptive changes, as Sarah spoke of, that constantly shift how input is received and treated. How you may learn to perform a task may be very different to how someone else is able to learn. 
and this is observable at this level. Each neuron can affect thousands of others with astronomical amount of synaptic connections between them all. In the networks we study, we follow how input and stimuli is primarily processed. Say a tactile or pain receptor in your hand, reacting to touch, relaying that to a neuron in the somatosensory or hand region of your brain. How this is then propagated and fed forward among other neurons that decide how in that information should be used. And even the higher order neuron popula populations, such as in the prefrontal cortex, that then modulate how those stimuli processing neurons should behave and subsequently interact with information, such as the reduction of required neurons to process it, making the process more efficient as you improve the performance of that function. So why are we interested in any of this? Basically to understand how our brains work. Taking that sensory processing, feeding that information on, and being modulated by higher order areas allows the necessary higher order brain activity, such as decision-making, working memory, and attention making up the basic functions behind your everyday behaviors you barely think about. The constant changing and strength in number of synaptic connections and how cells within vast networks are modulated means the way that we perceive and ultimately interact with our environment is unique to each brain. So how do we actually research this in networks and functions going on in our head? We use analogous models to look at how neurons behave, such as in the brain of a mouse, which has the same fundamental architecture and functions of a human brain with analogous regions performing the same basic roles and higher order functions behind complex behavior. But we still don't know every, how everything works and interacts with each other to manifest these functions and behaviors. In terms of the neural pathways used, we first start with tracing the functional connectivity using techniques such as optical tracing to be able to follow, sorry, to be able to follow along from one region to another by the use of viruses or other means where we're able to map and uh, image these connectivity, such as from this mass sensory cortex here in the middle of the brain to the prefrontal cortex here in the front of the brain, usually in the front of the brain of the human as well, imaging under microscopy and mapping these networks as we go. And then to the single cell activity level, primarily using patch clamping, whereby a tiny electrode patches onto a cell and reads its electrical output. Measuring its firing properties, oops, I accidentally clicked, sorry. <laughs> Measuring its firing properties of neuronal cell types to figure out how they behave to certain stimuli, whether they get enough info to help in its processing or not, and how strong and fast its connections to the next neurons are. With each spike, where the neuron fires, we're able to watch them fluoresce as a means of reporting when neurons are active and responding. And this happens quite quickly. As in, as in these particular brain models that fluoresce or glow when active, where we are able to image them in the top of the brain here, we can target specific neuron populations in the top layers of the mouse cortex displayed in green in this confocal microscopy image. Then, and this is what I spend the majority of my time training and imaging to capture in real time this top down view via wide field microscopy of a brain where she is performing a cognitive working memory task in response to forearm vibration. Functionally contributing regions are easily identifiable and measurable as fluorescent indicators of calcium, an essential ca characteristic of all neuronal firing and firing neurons. Here we can see the feed forward activity receiving stimuli from the forearm and feedback activity in the recipro reciprocally connected prefrontal cortex at the front of the brain, both actively used in this memory task. These neurons and even whole brain regions can be tempor temporarily inhibited to find out how each set of neurons contributes and to what extent for a given behavior. We're able to quantify the number of neurons where and when their activity contributes to a task or even turn off selectively in inhibit these parts of the brain, such as in this task where the prefrontal cortex in blue was found to be a feedback modulatory activity vitally ne necessary for the task by turning these neurons off. And so the task could no longer be performed by this once expert mouse. And this is the basis of how we investigate circuits by looking at the differences in how each neuron or population behaves. 
so that step by step, we can build the full picture from single cell activity through to behavior. From the differing genes making proteins that Sarah spoke of, single cells constantly adapting to the changing of strength and number of synaptic connections within a network. How and when these populations of neurons coordinate with one another to process information to perform a function, such as these neurons were affected by very few up in the top of the brain here, to ultimately encoding a behavior and how we interact with our uniquely perceived environment. How you make decisions. Understanding how neurons and network populations behave and are constantly modulated is key to understanding how our brains decide to interact with the world and how each person's behavior is differently encoded, processed and modulated. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thanks so much, Liam. Um, so now we have uh, Kate Huckstep uh, up next. Uh, Kate's uh, a PhD student at the Flora Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. Um, and I mean, that's not all they do. They do so much stuff. <laughs> so uh, Kate's an avid science communicator. Um, so hosting both a, a regular science comedy podcast uh, Curiosity Killed the Rat, uh, and a, also a science radio show, uh, Radio Lens, at the University of Melbourne. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Uh, take it away, Kate. Hi, guys. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Kate, and I'm a PhD student in the Addiction Neuroscience Lab at the Flurry Institute. And I'm going to be talking to you guys today about behavioral neuroscience and how we study behavior as preclinical neuroscientists. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from lands traditionally owned by the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to any Indigenous folk who may be joining us for this lecture. So I feel like the most logical place to start is with the question of why. Like, why, why do we bother? Why even study behavior? And if you think about it, the way that we behave underpins everything. When we think about what someone, you know, what makes someone who they are, a lot of that refers to, like, how they interact with the world. Every day, we all make thousands of tiny decisions, some conscious, some subconscious, which lead us to acting in certain ways. And researching this, really trying to understand the incredibly complex neural architecture that is driving each and every one of us to behave the way that we do, I think this is so important and it has so many real world applications. So for example, behavioral research can help inform us on how to develop communication campaigns around things like the COVID-19 vaccine, for example, to help influence behavior in ways that are most likely to benefit both individuals and also greater society. Or well, there's value to being able to predict the behavior of people in crisis situations like bushfires or extreme drought and being able to take this into account when planning how to handle these situations on a community, community scale. Or even learning how someone's environment and past experiences inform the way that they'll behave in response to certain life events and then using this knowledge to best support them. And by studying what happens in the brain during certain behavioral tasks and tests, we can begin to really truly embrace diversity and understand how brains are different and why they work the way that they do. But how do we do this? How do we zoom in on this brain level, circuit level, or even genetic level and see how each of these components are involved in specific behaviors? So while human behaviors certainly can be studied and are and applied behavioral science is a super important component in informing this overall picture. Uh, neuroscientists, or in particular, preclinical behavioral neuroscientists, such as myself, um, will study behavior using animal models. So this is where we get an animal, usually a rodent, like a rat or a mouse, to perform a particular behavioral task or test that we can measure their performance on. So, you know, as Liam alluded to, rodents are pretty genetically similar to humans and do possess analogous brain regions and signaling systems. But it is important to acknowledge that rats aren't humans, right? They're not, they're not the same. And so often a particular component of a very multifaceted condition or experience will be the thing that we're modeling. So, for example, something we're interested in might have a cognitive component, it might have a motor component and it might have a social component. 
And each of these can be modeled separately and studied in these highly controlled and highly controllable environments. Together, the information we get from these help inform our overall picture. And beyond just having a highly controllable environment in which to measure behaviors, using animals allows us to do something really important, which like has already been said tonight, it allows us to zoom in on the brain and really try and figure out the neural mechanisms that are driving these behaviors, right? We can learn cool things like which brain region is firing either while a behavior is occurring or even in the lead up to it. Or we can zoom in even further, you know, which signaling systems are involved, which neurochemicals are being released, which neurotransmitters, which receptors are they binding to? And we can ask, you know, how do certain genes or prior experiences change or inform these mechanisms, leading to the diversity that we see in both animal and human behavior? And given the similarities between rodent brains and human brains, these animal findings can then be used to inform further research, which is performed in humans. So I now want to go through a specific example of how we would model and research a particular behavior, and that is anxiety-like behavior. So scientists have known for a really long time how rats behave when they're anxious, right? We know that they like to stick to walls and enclosed spaces. They like dark places. And so there are several models which exist to test this type of behavior. And I've just got three examples up here. So we've got the elevated plus maze, where we can measure how much time an animal spends in an open arm of this elevated maze, as opposed to a safer enclosed arm. We've got the open field test, where we measure how much time an animal spends venturing out into the center, as opposed to clinging to the walls. And we've got the light dark box, where we can measure how much time an animal spends in the light side, as opposed to the comparatively safer dark half of the box. Now, the cool thing is if we administer a medication which reduces anxiety, like diazepam or Valium, you may be more familiar with that name, um, this is the exact type of behavior that we expect to see in these animals, right? We've got it hanging out on the open arm of the maze, venturing out into the center of the open field and hanging out in the light side of the box. And so, obviously, these are not the same tasks that we would test a human on, right, it, when measuring anxiety-like behavior in humans. But the fact that a medication, which we know is effective at reducing anxiety in humans, namely Valium, leads to these behavioral changes in rodents demonstrates that these models have a very good predictive validity. And I think that this is a really interesting example because it demonstrates the species-specific nature of these models and how we can translate that into making inferences about the overall human experience. So, cool. We can model these relevant behaviors relatively well in rodents, but how does this allow us to learn anything about the brain? Like, what can we actually do with these models? And the short answer is lots, and lots more than I have to time to cover off in the lecture right now, and Liam touched on a few um, of them, but I'm going to go through a few through a few other quick examples. So we can activate or inactivate different brain regions and or signaling systems to see whether this leads to changes in a particular behavior. And there are heaps of different ways that we can do this. But one way is through the administration of compounds or medications, right? So throwing back to our anxiety example, we could use one or more of those anxiety models to validate that any medication that we think is going to reduce anxiety actually does. Or on the flip side, we can actually test medications that are intended for an entirely different purpose, and we want to make sure that they don't have any anxiety increasing side effects. We can use these models to do that as well. Or we can just use this to inform us more about, you know, the neurochemical signaling systems that are underpinning and driving anxiety-like behavior. We can also pair behavioral experiments with microscopy. So this allows us to visualize exactly which cells were active during a certain behavior. So this is an image that I took from an animal that had just had a voluntary binge drink of alcohol, but you can do this type of staining and imaging following any behavioral task, social, cognitive, or whatever that you would like. And so you can see two main things here. We've got some of the neurons or cells here in blue. And we can identify which cells these are based on the staining that we choose to do. So I know that these cells express a particular protein that I stained for, acting like an ID tag of sorts. We can then also see these magenta dots, and they're inside some cells like this one and not inside others 
like this one, right? And so these tell us whether a cell was active during the behavior or not, because a cell will only make this protein if it has been firing. So this gives us some really cool insight into the neural mechanisms driving these behaviors, because we can learn not only where in the brain there was activity, but also whether certain cell types in that brain region were the active ones. And there are several techniques that also allow us to do this kind of thing in real time, which, you know, Liam briefly showed in uh, their presentation before, which is cool. Finally, we can investigate how impacts to genes affect particular types of behaviors. So we can look at animals with different genetic makeups and measure how they comparatively perform on different behavioral tasks. So through this, we can see what effect gene expression has on different behaviors. And what we see is that this leads to great diversity in both performance on behavioral tasks, but also in individual responses to medication. And in fact, even without the genetic differences, such as in genetically similar lines of animals, we see individual differences in human behavior, not unlike what we see in humans. So in summary, we study behavior in animal models because this allows us to begin to understand what is going on in the brain during particular activity during particular behaviors, sorry. So through this research, neuroscientists can begin to unpack neurodiversity and what's driving it at that molecular level. This knowledge can then be applied to real important real world scenarios, whether that be developing behavioral or pharmacological support for individuals who may be struggling with some facet of their experience or celebrating diversity and in doing so facilitating compassion for each individual's unique way of experiencing the world or even just inspiring awe at the complexity of the brain and how it informs and drives essentially the entire human experience which personally I think is incredible and invaluable research so thank you and I hope you guys got something from this presentation fantastic thanks heaps Kate uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Emma Burrows. So uh, Emma leads a lab of uh, wonderful people here at the Flory. Uh, so uh, her team uh, trained mice to um, play games on touch screens and, and uh, uses those sort of uh, techniques to learn more about uh, uh, attention and learning. Uh, so. Uh, Emma hopes that uh, a greater understanding of these sorts of, um, of differences that she's able to look at will help us to um, uh, investigate uh, and, and help to mitigate some of the challenges faced by people, for example, um, with autism. So thanks, Emma. Thank you, Sarah, and hello, everyone. I'm joining you from Wurundjeri land, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I thought I would start by telling you um, a little bit of a story um, from when I was 17 years old. So I had the privilege of working with autistic kids at this time, and it was then that I realised how different our brains could be. So my role was to assist them in transitioning from primary school to high school, which is a pretty big transition for anybody. I worked alongside one person in particular, and he was fascinated with mythical creatures, but specifically busting the myths surrounding them. We spent hours in the high school library researching sightings of the New Jersey devil, which you can see here. It's like hang a kangaroo sort of bat-like creature, quite terrifying. Um, I had to literally drag him away from his research. I watched as he expertly traded Pokemon cards at lunchtime, swooping in on the trading group to say hi, to acquire the specific card he needed for his collection and then retreating quickly once the deal was done. As we moved through the school corridors, we avoided air conditioning ducts, um, the number six, and also people whose name started with E. So I feel like I was the lucky exception here. I was in awe of his persistent sleuthing, um, his deft card trading, and fascinated by many things he said and did that I didn't understand. I realised then that we were seeing two very different realities and I was acutely aware of the ongoing challenges he would face as he grew older, especially. So for over a decade now, I have been researching how brain differences arise between autistic and neurotypical people. But before I delve into the brain, let me tell you why I believe autism research is important. So autism affects everyone differently and is commonly referred to as a spectrum for this reason. 
autistic people experience differences in the way they communicate and interact socially, and their behaviour may be repetitive or highly focused. People with autism also tend to experience differences with their senses, and that can affect the way they feel about and also respond to their surroundings. Although the core characteristics of autism can cause a range of challenges, it is important to recognise that these can also result in unique skills and capabilities. So why is autism research important? Autism affects 1% of the population. However, I think this is likely to be an underestimate as it is not well understood in adults or not well recognised, should I say, adults, women and girls, non-binary people and those from ethnic minorities. An improved diagnosis will not only help improve research, but for many a diagnosis brings understanding, support, community and pride. Many autistic people require support to attend school, to attend healthcare and also to um, work. 30% of those registered with their NDIS are autistic and this support is frequently insufficient. And worryingly, uh, the future of the NDIS is currently under threat. So we've got to think about that when we vote um, this year. We need research to know where the unmet needs are so we can divert resources and also to advocate for increased funding and policy change. Accessibility in workplaces that are structured to favour neurotypicals is also another major roadblock for work to work, sorry, for some autistic people. We are really missing out on impressive, diverse and world-changing contributions. At least 70% of autistic people also describe one or more co-occurring conditions, ranging from epilepsy, sleep disturbances to anxiety. These co-occurring conditions can require management for autistic people to live to their full potential, and currently these options are inadequate. There are many autistic, um, sorry, many interventions available also which do not have robust scientific evidence and they can cause significant harm. A major therapy implemented in childhood, ABA, has been gathering widespread um, and loud criticism from the autistic and also research community for the harm it causes. Understanding more about autism will also increase awareness in neurotypicals, and this will result in more representation of autistic people in decision-making and in creating and potentially to change the status quo, which I believe we need more than ever. So now time to delve into the brain. And this has been beautifully set up by the speakers before me. And I think you're all convinced now that no person is the same and also that we can agree that it is our brain differences that underlie this. I want to know how this actually impacts on neurodivergence. This is not an easy question to answer and the complexity in this visual in particular is simply staggering. Every one of our 86 billion neurons stretch their branches to connect with many others, forming circuits and highways that underlie all our thoughts and behaviours. Our highways remain stable throughout life. Our genetic code determines this, but our circuits and connections change every time we interact with our world. Your brain is changing now as I speak. The stability of a connection is very much determined by how active it is. Are you using it, for example? Neurons that are very active have very stable connections. Think those neurons that are responsible for toothbrushing. Neurons communicate across the space, and you've been introduced to the synapse. The signals they use are both electric and chemical. The neuron upstream is the one that carries the electrical impulse, and this triggers the release of chemicals called neurotransmitters and they go across the synapse. And neurotransmitters are part of an important chain. They find and bind to specialised receptors and they cause them to change in configuration. This is key to allow influx of charge ions, which then changes the electrical activity in the neuron downstream. And this is exactly how the message is carried on. Our genetic code is responsible for the initial wiring of our brains, even in utero. DNA, we rep represent it like a string of letters. Um, but what happens if there's a change in the letter code? It could result in a small functional change that still makes sense. For example, I have a cat becomes I have a cat. Sorry, it could become I have a cat or cat I have. This has the same meaning. However, some gene variations, although still small, can bring a new function to the sentence or gene. Gene changes make us unique, help us to evolve, fight illness, take on new challenges, and sometimes they give us strengths, sometimes difficulties. Autism runs in families, and while there is no specific genetic cause for most cases of autism, many gene changes have been linked. 
These gene changes have been found in the machinery in our synapses. Is autism a result of changes in connections? We can trace these gene changes across families and those that link very strongly. Uh, these are very rare and they don't appear in the general population. And my team studies these changes. We hope our research will be relevant, not just to these specific families, but that we can transfer this knowledge back to the broader community. So we focus on one gene change found in two autistic brothers. This gene change is a single letter change, like the cat to rat example. The gene change occurs in the DNA that codes for protein that spans the synapse, and we call this neuroligin 3. We think that this gene change stops it binding with the other protein on the other side of the synapse. This destabilizes the synapse and changes its function. Many other genetic changes in the surrounding protein network have also been found. We don't have any way of, of looking at this closely in people, so it's for this reason we turn to mice. Mice share a lot of genetic similarities with humans and changes in mouse DNA mimic changes in humans and vice versa. So mice with genetic changes linked to autism actually show differences in the way they interact with the environment and also with other mice. When we introduce neuroligin 3 gene into our mice, they interact in more stereotyped ways. Of course, mouse interaction is very different to how humans interact, but could neuroligin 3 have a role uh, in how we interact socially? Our mice also communicate differently. Many of you may not have heard ultrasonic mouse song because it is actually 10 times higher than our human ears can detect. We have co-opted microphones used to eavesdrop in on bat ultrasonic calls to listen to our mice. We can pitch shift and slow these sound recordings so we're able to hear them. I'm about to play our sound recording for you now. And I hope um, if you have particularly sensitive ears, you might want to take out your earphones. Sounds a little like bird song. It's very beautiful. So we use this um, ultrasonic language and to understand how mice communicate, and they use it in many different social contexts. So we're currently investigating this in Neuralink and three mice. But I want to talk in particular in more detail about how maybe different connections um, that result as a result of neuroligin 3 gene changes, maybe they change the way these mice perceive the world. How do we even study this? Clinical data shows that some autistic people have sticky attention. So what does this mean? They can focus their attention extremely well, but they have great difficulty disengaging. This can make busy and loud environments overwhelming and equally can lead to super skills and interests. We use touchscreens to show stimuli to mice and to capture their nose poke responses on an iPad. Using these touchscreen chambers that you can see here, we can measure attention in the same way as what we do in the clinic. You can see here mice are rewarded for touching either a vertical or a horizontal stimulus, and they're getting a little shot of strawberry milkshake, seven microliters. They work very hard. This mouse here shows perfect inhibition. So part of this task is actually to inhibit responses to four distractor stimuli. And I was absolutely blown away when our mice did this uh, for the first time. They're quite complex and very smart little creatures. So what do we see in our neuroligin 3 mice? So when we're looking at the signal, so these are the correct responses. Neuroligin 3 mice in red are hovering above the neurotypical or the wild type mice the whole way through training. So we train our mice on a regular basis. Clearly, we don't have the language to ask our mice to do this task. So we rely on them spontaneously exploring. So you can see here, they are actually a lot better at this task. They're extremely focused. What about the distractor images? Well, actually, NL3 mice are less likely to respond to the distractors. And this um, was a little surprising. Uh, because we anticipated that they might be showing something that's clinically um, described. So what we thought we'd do, because it's a very big difference between this task and those that um, are administered to people, are uh, the number of days. You don't go into a psychology lab every day for 18 days straight. So we wanted to know what happens when we actually push um, the, the attention. And so just firstly, before I um, get to that, I'll talk about the signal 
uh, response time. So you can see here our mice in particular, part of their advantage is that they're actually waiting. They're quite conservative in their response. So when we really push our animals, first I'll show you the signal uh, at two seconds. So two seconds is the amount of time we show the stimulus in training. So our mice are very well practiced at this. They know how to do this. What happens, or we call this low uh, load. What happens when we increase the load? They lose their advantage. And in some cases, when we're measuring um, accuracy in particular, or the hit rate, they actually go below the neurotypical or the wild type mice. So this is a really powerful example of a hyper-focused mouse. And when the environment becomes unpredictable, they lose this advantage. And we were very excited to see this. So what are we doing now? Our team are currently working with clinical researchers. And in particular, um, we're trying to use relevant touchscreen tasks, but also we're trying to track brain changes in the Neuroligin 3 mice using MRI. We are miniaturizing their methods, and this will allow us to see which connections and highways are different as a result of the gene change. So this research, while as close as possible to people, um, it's only going to be useful to people if we're all in this together. Co-design is an emerging field, bringing people working in all spaces and people with lived experience together to ensure that no stone is uncovered and that we are not limited by lack of brain diversity. I believe that understanding how different brains are wired and why some things are easier or difficult is really important. This will help to change our environment and also the neurotypical understanding to allow autistic people to thrive. I believe there is a lot that we are missing out on. So lastly, but not least, I'd like to thank my team who are very important um, and drive a lot of this work. So I've just got a, just quickly a, a picture of them to show you my beautiful team. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, what a shame. I need to finish off on their beautiful faces. And here I've got a call coming through as well. Here they are here. Thank you so much for your time. And I, um, I won't take up any more time because I know we've got a really exciting panel coming up. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, it's now my uh, very great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce our, our panellists for today. So uh, Dr. Sophia Friends has a PhD in genetics uh, and just a lot of opinions about the world, really. <laughs> uh, uh, so Sophia is currently a data consultant at ELISA uh, and is based in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and they received one of Out for Australia's uh, 30 Under 30 Awards because they're just awesome, an all-round awesome human being. Uh, and they're now a non-executive director for that organisation. Uh, we also have Dr Daphne Cohen, who's joining us today. Uh, Daphne is just a straight-up overachiever. Um, <laughs> Phenomenal human in, in all ways possible, really. Uh, Daphne is an uh, emergency physician in training, uh, is currently working in clinical forensic uh, medicine. Uh, if, if, as if that's not enough, uh, she's also a published poet, bioethicist, and an aspiring novelist, which is just, it's a little bit intimidating, not going to lie. Uh, so thank you both so much for uh, joining us here today. Uh, Sophia, let me start with you. Uh, do you want to sort of lead us off with telling us a bit about uh, yourself and, and your experience of neurodivergence? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, both myself and Daphne, are New Zealanders. Um, I moved over to Australia about eight years ago. Um, shortly after that, I was actually diagnosed with autism and a very funny conversation with my doctor um, we were sort of going through the list and she's like, oh, and you do, do you have any special interests? And I'm like, well, like, I moved to Australia to do a PhD. So, yes, <laughs> of course I do. Like, everyone I know does. Is this unusual? Um, and then after those conversations, I then went back to a group of friends that I had who were still in New Zealand and I said, oh, so it, it turns out I'm autistic. And they said, oh, we knew. Did you not know? We thought you knew. Like, oh, all of us are. Like, were you not aware of that? Um, and I think that's, like, fairly typical for a lot of people, right, uh, in this kind of experience where you come to this realisation, your adult life, particularly for people who, like, are assigned females at birth or are raised, like, 
as girls, essentially, um, the way that you tend to present with neurodiversity is different enough due to your socialization that you don't really um, get picked up as readily in childhood. Something I'm really happy about now is that a lot of kids are like regardless of their gender, which is really awesome to see. But for a lot of people of our kind of generation, I'm turning 30 this year, oh no, um, like just wasn't picked up in childhood. And so you get that diagnosis later in life um, and then you realise every single person that you are friends with is also neurodiverse. <laughs> um, we just kind of cluster together. It's like being queer in conservative schools. You come out of school, you're five years out of school and you're like, oh, we're all gay. Yeah okay cool this this was coming um, so that's like that's the sort of high level picture of my journey with neurodiversity i know we're going to delve into it a little bit deeper but i'll let you uh get daphne to introduce herself as well yeah great i mean daphne i'll, I'll throw to you now oh hi hello you obviously googled me because i didn't tell you some of that stuff so or did sophia spill the beans anyway um I forgot the question, so can you please repeat it? That was my cat, by the way, uh, Pan. He's, he left, I don't know. He doesn't want to be on the panel. Understandable. I mean, look, that's fair. Uh, the question was, uh, tell us a, a bit about yourself and your experience of uh, uh, neurodivergence. Right, okay. Well, um, as Sophia said, I am also a Kiwi. I was actually born in Melbourne, but, you know, to immigrant parents, so that doesn't count, who then went to New Zealand and you know, stayed there because I guess it was easier to stay. Um, so that's where I grew up. Um, and then I moved back here about five years ago after finishing uh, studies, all my studies. And um, uh, yeah, and I've been, well, I've been sort of working and living in Melbourne since then. I like Melbourne. It's a nice city. Uh, I guess I don't, I, I'm very new to this whole neurodiversity thing. I only was, I guess, informally diagnosed a few months ago. I'm, I'm still having conflicted feelings about it, I suppose. I don't know that I, I mean, I obviously diagnose myself ahead of time, as I do with all of my personal health issues. Um, and then I went to, like, do the right thing and actually get a specialist. Uh, and and yet I still am not sure I agree with the specialist's diagnosis. It's it's still possible that I just suck, and that is the explanation for all of it. You know what I mean? And that I have I don't know enormous personal problems <laughs> that are the reason for all of that stuff. Um, so I don't know. It's pretty new uh, for me. I, I haven't really had a lot of experience uh and I also um I just kind of uh I'm already bored and over it I've already moved on to other things that are going on in my life I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about it anymore uh once I've, I sort of like got over that little hump um yeah I think that what, what you've sort of mentioned um it's a, I mean both for both of you right it's a really common experience for um, women, trans, and, and non-binary folk to um, be diagnosed later in life. Um, and by later in life, I just mean adulthood, not childhood, really. So, um, so why was it important for, for you to get a diagnosis and, and how much of a challenge was it? Um, I can start off with this. Uh, I was particularly, like, it wasn't, I didn't go into that first conversation saying, I know I'm autistic. I need this diagnosis. I went into it being like, okay, so a friend has revealed to me that apparently everyone else knows what's happening when people make like facial expressions, right? Like there's the obvious ones that are like smile, frown, grimace, right? And then there's the subtle ones. And I'm like, this means something, but I don't know what it is. And they made some joke about like this being like an autistic thing. And I was like, excuse me, what? I thought this was a lie. We told to everyone like drop bears, you know, like you know, the a whole society can get around behind drop bears as a lie. Obviously they're also all lying about this thing. Like that is the only logical explanation. And so I went to my doctor and I was like, so this, I have thought this and it turns out I was wrong. And she was like, we're just going to do a questionnaire, Sophia. 
we're just we're gonna do a couple of questionnaires with you okay yeah. um and that kind of put me on the path but when I did get my diagnosis it was like it was good for sort of two big reasons right it's firstly like I mm, I hate saying it like this I don't come across as autistic right like when people think autistic they don't think about someone who is gregarious who can talk for as long as I am going to talk while I answer this question like who is kind of sociable and outgoing in the way I often am. Um, but it is how my brain works on the inside. And so like having that explanation and being able to go like, no, I seem like I'm good at all of the social stuff, but actually I'm just very, very smart. And I understand a lot of social things with like a very complex algorithm in my brain. Um, being able to have a word for that was really helpful. The other thing was that I was <laughs> very aggrieved when I got it because a solid three years of my childhood, my brother had been like assessed for autism and like learning difficulties and all of this, which like, you know, that's a trauma he has to unpack. Um, but I was just like, ah, oh, you checked the wrong child. It was me all along. You should have paid more attention to me, which as the oldest, I'm sure anyone else on this call, um, in this that's an oldest child understands that particular aggrievedness. And like, finally I was vindicated. Um, but yeah, that's, it wasn't like, it was important after it happened. It wasn't important before it happened. Right. Uh, so Daphne, what about you then? Like why why go about it in the first place? Um, well, so I, look, I mean, this honestly wasn't even really on my radar until I guess partway through last year when suddenly all my friends had ADHD. Like, um, I mean, you know, like I, I'm... I'm probably the, for most of my friends, I'm the only kind of medical person that they, um, that they know. And so uh, they usually like tell me that their stuff, you know, and I, I listen and, and sort of make all the right noises. Um, and, you know, a couple of them have sort of mentioned over the years that they thought they might have ADHD and, and were thinking about getting a diagnosis. And I was like, yeah, you do. I mean, you know what I mean? Like you for sure. I flattered with you. Yeah. hundred percent. Go find out. You know what I mean? It can only be a good thing for you. Like I'm not, I'm not a psychiatrist, but this is totally plausible to me. And then, you know, then they're all like, oh yeah, turns out it's true. And I'm like, zero surprises there, but I didn't relate to any of what they were really saying. You know what I mean? The, like it was just a very different, I mean, and these were all still women, some of them, some of them were men, you know, various, like um, people, various types of people. Um, and then, but anyway, I kept hearing about it and then other people were talking about things that I was like, that's not ADHD. That's normal. That's normal. Everybody is like that. You know, those are all totally normal things that you're describing that, you know, definitely are not ADHD. And then they'd get diagnosed with ADHD. And then I was like, wait a minute, what? Um, hang on a sec. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and you know, so slowly I, sort of, I guess, dawned on me. Um, and then I got very upset about it for a while, um, I guess, because um, I have spent my whole life knowing I was different from most of the other people around me. And I had so many different reasons why that might be the case. Like, you know, um, immigrant family, different culture, different communication styles, um, and this is going to sound like a humble brag, but Sophia already did it. So I'm going to do it too. I, I'm very smart, <laughs> but it's not just me. My whole family is very smart. I'm literally the only one of my siblings without a PhD and I'm the one with the medical degree, you know, uh, like, and we just stuck out in like small town, New Zealand, you know, we were just not like anyone, any other family that I knew. And I, you know, I was assumed it was that. So it wasn't until I got to university that I guess I found my people and realized that the world was divided into my people and everyone else who sucked um, and was normal, you know. And I then I, I thought maybe it was, um, uh, you know, common interests, you know, like we were all geeks and nerds and stuff like that. But actually, I'd never had those interests. I picked those interests up out of that social, like, friendship, you know, like, and, you know, going to the same clubs because they were doing D, D, so i did D because they were my friends and that was you know really it wasn't because D D was what brought us together or whatever um and then i just uh, i don't know i guess i was just like well some people are not my kind of people you know they're just not my people 
they're not on my wavelength. They're just like different and other and though and they're hard to do they're hard to work with they're hard to get along with they're hard to communicate with they're hard to understand and that's just the two types of people in the world the people that I get and the people I don't get and I never really um I didn't have any other explanation for why that might be and then when literally they almost to all of them were getting diagnosed with either ADHD or occasionally autism, but mostly ADHD. Um, it's uh, like, I was, it was very um, like a very kind of, I guess, eye opening moment for me. And then it also, a lot of other things started to make sense. Like there was this one time that I did speed at a party and I waited to get high and nothing happened. And I sat there the whole time being like, oh, okay, well, is something, am I supposed to feel something? you know, and I didn't, um, uh, and don't worry, that was a long time ago and it was a different country. So, you know, there's no the statute of limitations is over probably. And well and truly over, you Fine. know, um, but, uh, and I always like, well, maybe it was just bad drugs, you know, like who knows? And then later I tried to track down. I mean, I talked to my friends who were all at that party who also did the speed and they were all like, yeah, didn't do anything. But also then and later I got diagnosed with ADHD. So that didn't actually help me. <laughs> Narrowed and, it down. I was like, I need to find someone who's at that party who didn't get diagnosed with ADHD later and ask them, like, like, was it bad drugs or what? But unfortunately, I couldn't find anyone who had a clear memory of that night who was there and not diagnosed with ADHD. So, you know, I, uh, I had almost know. the same thing where I took Riddle and at a party and suddenly I could just like hear people's conversations over background noise. And I was like, oh, this is great. Drugs are amazing, guys. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, this is why you all do it. And they're like, no, we're high, Sophie. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I love these real life studies. Uh, we do that in the lab, but you know, you uh, feel free to explore that as well. Uh, uh, so, yeah. look, uh, what you've both kind of touched on here, really interestingly, is uh, is the importance of community, right? And so, um, you've kind of both found your community in sort of. Uh, different ways so um how important do you think that is and and you know do you have any I guess I don't know hints or tips for people who are, who are seeking that out I mean I think it's really important I don't know that I have any hints or tips because I naturally gravitated towards people that I liked being around you know and at university it was really easy to do that you know much more so than at high school I had very few friends at high school because like there weren't my people. My people were not there. And then when I got to university, I was like, oh, these are my people. And, and you know, it's very, it's such a, it's an environment that there are so many people around and, and you're not constrained by your studies or, or your age or anything like that. It's really easy to find people. And I just naturally gravitated towards them. And they're the ones who stuck around in my life, you know, because the other people are just really hard work. They're just hard work. Um, and they don't tend, I don't know, they just end up, those friendships don't last in the way that these ones have. So, yeah. the, you know, I don't, it wasn't a, di like, I didn't know, we, none of us knew, to be honest, about, you know, any, like, why it was. We just knew that, you know, we got along and we liked each other and we were good friends. And, um, I mean, that, that was really great. Yeah. And it's still great. Can I quite similar to the queer experience in that way. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's let's throw to you a then. lot of overlap, right? Yeah. Like it's both in the sense that like we, we both very much work on found family and finding our own communities. Um, but also in that like a lot of uh, trans and gender diverse people, I was reading a paper the other day, have ADHD and autism. Like it's way higher in our population than in the general population. Um, I think when it comes to like finding community, I think you have to give yourself permission to try and fail like just do things go to things you think you might like meet people you might enjoy I've had so many friendships end because I have not been able to tell when someone is mad at me like if someone's I am I am not I'm very self-centered but I'm not so self-centered as to assume that when someone can't like text me back that they're mad at me like and that is something that took like a bit of therapy to get over because like that also like comes from a bit of anxiety that it's like no that's actually really self-centered Sophia that's not the case but then sometimes it is and if you don't know and the person you're talking to is not autistic or is acting in a way where they expect you to read their mind like that's nonsensical to me and it's nonsensical to every neurodiverse person I speak to 
And whenever I describe this to someone who is not neurodiverse, they go, oh yeah, but, but you can tell, right? No, that's not how any of this works. Um, but yeah, when it comes to community, like not everyone is going to be in your life forever and that's okay, right? Like sometimes people are friends and in your community for a particular amount of time and then they move on. But also just like try stuff out, like go to a book club, take up a sport. Or just try everything out at once. Join like three book clubs, do it in the same year that you've got your, made your thesis due or made your exams. Uh, pick up a language, a sport, an instrument, all at the same time. Just do all of that. That would be... Yeah, and if you do that, you you might have ADHD. <laughs> I mean, the great thing is, though, that while you're procrastinating one of the things, you can do the other thing. You can just, like, bounce around between them. You get a lot done that <laughs> way. You know, you're you're mm -hmm. like, oh, I can't possibly face the doing, you know, grammar study, so I'll just practice the violin instead. Um, and, you know, and then when you're, like, cannot possibly look at another you know, stave, uh, just uh, like go and, I don't know, like read the dictionary. I mean, whatever, you know what I mean? Just do all of that stuff. Like that's. <laughs> okay. That's you say that as a joke, no. but I, I, I genuinely was very interested in um, etymology. Actually, I was interested in both of them, the words and the bugs um, as a child and would like read the dictionary to understand the meanings of, yeah, words, so. reading a dictionary is a normal thing to do when you're a child. That's it is. normal. And yet, yeah. and yet I was 21 okay. before I was diagnosed. No, really this is how you lead to being the overachievers that you are. So what else is also normal what? is having arguments around the dinner table with your family about the origin of words where then, like, you had to resolve it by going to read the dictionary because there wasn't, you know, there wasn't internet at that time. Um, but like first you would argue about it for 20 minutes or longer and then you, someone would be like, would go get the dictionary. That's normal. This is a normal thing. I mean, you talk about found yeah. family and that, which is great, but like also, um, my family is also is on my wavelength, you know, and I, yeah. I don't know if the, the, they have ADHD in the sense that like, I don't know, they don't seem to have some of the same struggles that I have. Um, they like, it was quite illuminating talking to my dad, actually. I, he didn't know why I was asking this, but because we don't have a great relationship, but, you know, he, about what I was like as a child. Um, and he was like, yes, you were an extremely reckless child who would wander off. Like when I was three, and I do vaguely remember this, we, we were like at a national park and I was like hanging out on the edge of a cliff where there were no railings, just enjoying. And I remember being like, oh yeah, very pretty field patchwork, all those hundreds of meters down below me I'm I, that's nice and then you know my dad spots his toddler daughter sitting literally sitting on the edge of a cliff which I was doing because it was fun and freaks out and tries to pull me away from the edge of the cliff and I physically struggle with him because I want to keep sitting on the edge of a cliff you know I mean that's yeah so I would like uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I was a reckless child. And I don't know that my siblings necessarily had any of that. Um, but in some respects, um, we're all a bunch of uh, ridiculous overachievers. Uh, and they, too, be have believe intrinsically that they are lazy. And that's something I'm trying to maybe suggest to them that they're not. But, <laughs> you know, who knows? But we're getting there. But maybe, maybe it's not... I don't know, maybe there's some other reason. But, it might uh, also, I think it's probably also useful, Daph, if you talk a bit about your work um, as an emergency room doctor, because that seems very conducive to being ADHD, that kind of oh, environment. Oh, yeah. I mean, so I, um, I, I did medicine because it seemed like a good idea at the time and like somebody suggested it to me, which is pretty much the reason why I think any teenager chooses any career path. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no other like you have no idea what you're doing and nobody even if someone explained it to you it, you still would have no grasp of what what the what that meant but um you know I was and this is I was just good at a lot of academic subjects without effort and this is probably why I flew under the radar for a really long time because I didn't study um, and not studying just didn't seem to be a problem. I mean, I would literally do homework on the way to school that would still get like A plus marks. You know, I beat myself up for being bad at maths 
because I only got an A in maths and I got an A plus and everything else, you know. Um, but I had older brothers who were literally doing university maths in high school. So I just had a totally skewed idea of what normal, you know, achievement was. Um, and, um, and I didn't actually really have to do study until the end of med school, which is three degrees is my, like, that's like, I was 24 at that point, you know, um, what were we, what was the question again? Oh yeah. <laughs> emergency medicine. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, so I started out in science because I failed to get into medical school for being too immature, uh, which is honestly fair enough. Um, cause I was 17, uh, and no 17 year old should be allowed into medical school, actually, quite frankly. I don't think it's very common here. I think here it tends to be, you do an undergrad, undergrad degree I think and you do medicine. Undergrad, but yeah. there are some undergrad entry schools, which I just think is terrible. But, um, so that's why I failed to get in. So then I went to do science and research and, and I was at a crossroads about science, doing a PhD on medicine. And, um, I chose medicine because I thought a PhD wasn't like immediate enough to start you know, <laughs> you were gonna say because I thought a PhD was bad which they are right like well, I mean okay well look I was actually quite sensible looking back on my decisions as a teenager I thought a PhD was probably going to be not as good job wise and also I had an acceptance to medical school in my hand and I figured I could always come back and do a PhD later if I really wanted to which is technically true, but I probably wasn't going to get accepted to medical school a, like a second time after being rejected once already. So, you know. You've done, um, you've yeah. done everything else, Daphne, so you may as well do a PhD. Like I suspect a PhD. Something in your back pocket for later. Honestly, <laughs> I think a PhD lurks in my future. I don't know. It's out there. It's waiting for me. It's, you know, I, who knows. But I'll be doing a PhD as a clinician, which is great. Um you know, you get all the assistance and you still get paid. It's amazing. And like, you don't have to do any of that bullshit because you're like, hello, I'm actually a specialist already in this field. So um, I'm not going to do that. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. I have to go save people's lives. Uh, I don't have time to be in the lab in the night. But anyway, that's a side. So that's what I recommend. If you're going to do a PhD, do medicine first, be a doctor, pick a specialty and then do a PhD, but also don't do medicine it's terrible. It's the worst. Do not do it. I cannot recommend it at all. Um, anyway, so, but I did and it sucked. Uh, and I hated almost every minute of every specialty that I did as a junior doctor rotating through. Uh, and the only thing that didn't absolutely suck the worst was emergency medicine was the only thing that I could remotely tolerate. Um, and so at the end of the day, it's I've somehow just by following my own inclinations wound up in the most ADHD friendly job, you know, that there is. Uh, everything is immediate. Um, uh, my, I do, I make very brief notes, like, and nobody expects anything else. I barely sit down like at any, you know, I'm up and moving, walking around the whole time. Um, there's this great, uh, like memory aid for remembering to do things, which is called nurses who come and hassle you about doing a thing that you haven't done. If you haven't done it yet, you know, and if you still don't do it, then they continue, then they just come up again later to hassle you. And like, don't forget to chart that medication that, you know, whatever, um, you don't have to be that precise. And I, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, we don't, you know, care and we're not, you know, trying to get things right. But um, the focus is not, it's on safety. It's on making the right call. It's all about judgment. You don't have, you never have all the information. You yeah. know, you may never make the diagnosis. You might only be able to say that, that at least there's nothing life-threatening going on, you know, um, or that there's something going on and it's something that you need to get a surgeon for. That might be the furthest that you get in figuring out what it is, you know, with what the tools that you have available. And that's okay. That's what it's, a, that's what it's for. So, you, you know, there's a still, I mean, there's an enormous amount of knowledge, obviously, that you have to absorb. Um, I mean, I sat my uh, first set of exams for emergency medicine last year, uh, which again was like, it was almost over 12 months of study, which is just a marathon effort for me. Um, 
And, um, you know, I paced and picked and, you know, my way through it, like my, the skin on my face was just like disgusting by the end of it. Um, and, uh, but, you know, but I got through it. Now I can thankfully forget 90% of that stuff uh, because it's not super relevant in the day to day. Once you've absorbed it, you understand the principles. You know, there are always reference books to double check things. There are pharmacists who make sure you don't make dosing errors um, and nurses who make sure you don't make dosing errors, you know. Um, so it's pretty good for ADHD, I guess, is all I'm saying. Yeah, so that's what, that was going to be sort of my next question, really, which was you kind of, you know, touched on really nicely, which is how, how uh, you know, being being a neurodivergent has helped helped you or, or um, you know, uh, impacted how you uh, navigated your career. So what about you, Sophia? I was just thinking, I'm in the wrong fucking career for being autistic, right? Because, like, I'm a consultant. My whole job is based on, like, relationships and reading people and knowing what's going on. It's just like, God, I actually, like, I had a conversation with my boss, like, last year where I was just like, I realised that, like, I screwed up this relationship and I realised that that screw-up happened because I'm autistic. But, like, let's not, I just, oh, like, being autistic just makes my job harder. It doesn't make me worse at my job, right? That's that's okay, right? Um, so, yeah, it's really, it's not, it's good in some ways and it's not good in a lot of other ways um, yeah. when you are constantly having to navigate, like, complex relationships. Like I said, like, had a situation where I did not change at all how I was communicating with the client and they changed with me and I was like, okay, that's weird probably not about me, like your roles just changed dramatically, you're probably stressed. And then I leave that client site and that guy like goes to my boss and is like, Sophia was really mean in the last few months. And it's like, oh, you could have told me, bud. Like we had this conversation where I said, I'm autistic. This is how I prefer to communicate. Are you okay with that? Please let me know if that changes. So it's very much like a, I can do everything to like kind of support that I want to do and I'm always gonna be like in some way fucked by my neurodivergence but like I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be any other way like I'm I retain information like a sponge like I see things so logically and a lot of like um a lot of the way that I as an autistic person and autistic people I've met tend to see the world is like very similar to computer programming. And like, I'm a data consultant. Like I need to understand how computers think. And to me, it just makes sense. It's like, cool. So you need this, 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 and this. All right, let's go. Um, so I can work through things like very quickly. Yep. Definitely, I'm I'm very fast, a lot of things I do. But yeah, the relationship thing is always going to be uh, making things a bit more difficult for me. But you know, life would be boring if it was easy. So what kind of supports then do you wish you'd had earlier or even now I mean you're doing so much of the work already right like yeah I mean like a lot of it there. relies yeah a lot of it relies on like other people like basically like responding <laughs> like believing me when I say things because like mm. I don't have a problem if someone's like hey Sophia that was a bit blunt can you not like I um so I teach high schoolers through the Debaters Association Victoria we do um student debating it's a lot of fun uh highly recommend for some pocket money if you want to um and sometimes I'll be chatting to the kids and I'll be like okay like how do you how do you want your feedback like you guys seem pretty experienced like do you want me to just like immediately talk about the things I need criticism on do you want me to talk about the things that like you did well as well and they'll be like oh you can start with the criticism and I will and they'll be like not like that <laughs> I'll be like, okay. And I'll pull back and I'll be like, hey, like this other stuff went really well. Like this is where like the beginning of what the thing you need to learn is. And it's just, it's so infuriating from like a personal level that I work with people like in their late twenties, their thirties, their forties. And these are people who can't be upfront with me. Right. Like, and obviously I have a particular view of the situation. I'm sure the people, like many of the people who have done this to me, cause it's not just one person. We know this, right? Yeah. Like, they thought they were being super clear. Um, but that's not the case. It's I need I need people to 
be straightforward. I honestly, like, I don't understand how neurotypicals get along with each other. It just seems very intense. Like, when you're meant to be, like, guessing what everyone thinks all the time and you're never telling each other how you feel and, you know, just it's so weird to me and it's I'm very pleased to like the next generation given like the amount of interactions that I have with high schoolers who are very willing to be up front in that way um but right now with the current generation of people I'm working with I'm like oh my god go to therapy yeah so so what kind of steps have you know have workplaces either put in place or uh uh, all that you'd like to see, let's say that. Uh, I Yeah, okay, good question. I usually have to like, I mean, the thing with autism, right, and I think um, Emma actually covered this a bit on her talk, is it's very dynamic in how you experience it, right? So like I I haven't been nonverbal in about six years, but it used to happen. Like I would just get really stressed out. I'd get really overwhelmed and I just wouldn't be able to speak and I'd be like, Um, and that's weird, <laughs> um, both to experience internally, but to try and communicate to literally anyone around you that like, they're like, you're a normal human being. And it's like, no, I'm not though. <laughs> um, so like understanding that, like, there is a dynamism to how people experience the world through neurodiversity and their access needs and their support needs might change on a daily basis. Right. Um, something my work does that like. I really had to be like, okay, I'm not going to need this all the time. You don't have to do this all the time. Having the option is important. It's stuff like in meetings, being really clear about like how questions or engagement needs to happen. So like if someone's running a workshop and they're like, cool, just ask questions whenever, you know, feel free to interrupt me. I'm like, I absolutely do not feel free to interrupt you, but thank you for that. <laughs> like, let me put it in the chat and tell me when you're going to read the chat. Like, that is what I need in order to actually engage in this workshop, in this meeting, in the seminar. Um, similarly, just like setting out boundaries for things, um, being clear about, I, I'm not, I don't need agendas for every meeting, but I need a clear purpose. I think um, everyone can kind of like, identify with the horror of like your immediate boss just putting a meeting in your diary that just says chat and you're like no no chat thank you that's like the work version of um, your partner calling you up and saying that you we need to talk it's like yeah. the, you're, you're yes. like you're getting fired that's what's happening that's what this yeah. chat is yes yeah, no I've, like, comes from I've got quite a good relationship yeah I've got a, quite a good relationship with the CEO of my organization and Whenever he used to like just give me a phone call when he wanted my advice on something, and I was like, James, that gives me a fucking heart attack. Phone call, like some kind of psychopath. But also, like, yeah, and also, like, if I miss a phone call from the CEO of my company, like, what am I gonna think? So now, okay. when he does that, he then texts me and says, "You're not in trouble." I was once. <laughs> and that's very helpful. I was once directly called on my personal cell phone when I was quite junior by the medical director of a hospital. So, of course, I immediately died um, and I was in trouble, you know, um, like it wasn't a chat. The medical director of the hospital does not call an intern just to have a chat, you know. Um, so, I mean, I wasn't in big trouble in the end but because I, I just blamed my my registrar who's like, you know, told me to do the thing that I'd done that they weren't happy about. But, uh, yeah, that's terrifying. So what about you then, Daphne? With, you know, is there anything that like you kind of go, oh, gosh, if as a kid, if, you know, there had been this support available, that would have been so useful for me. Mm, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess it's difficult because I didn't really struggle academically at school, so I can't really speak to that. Um, Did you um, have the thing where you got bullied just a huge amount and the school was like, that's yeah. just girl friendship. I was a loud mouthed, smart kid who had like zero survival instincts in the playground. So yeah, I got bullied a whole ton, you know, um, by, by like, I don't, well, you know, well, you can imagine anyway, by, well, I guess mostly girls, I suppose, uh, tend to bully other girls. Um, and uh the school I don't know that like what are they going to do anyway you know what I mean like they can't really do anything uh and you already lose just by telling the teacher you know so there was pretty much nothing to be done um and that was kind of also like the beginning and pretty much the end as well of like my queer identity because 
Um, I mean, I got like one crush on one girl and then the other girls, I don't know how they knew because I didn't do or say anything, but they like accused me randomly of being a lesbian, which was of course terrible. It was the worst thing you could be in 2000 when you're like 10 or 11 years old. Um, and so, you know, just buried that whole thing right down for a solid 20 years. Yeah. You know, that was it. Um, so, <laughs> so, so what I'm hearing is like better supports around bullying and anti-bullying. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's just, I don't know that there's anything specific about sort of the neurodiverse thing or anything. The, I mean, the biggest challenge that I faced was that like, I was a smart kid and I was bored in class. And this was the, this was the alleged reason for all of my disruption was that I was too smart and too bored. And those probably were also true. Um, I, yeah, I, just, I, I got in a lot of trouble for like reading during maths class and I just like handed over the homework book we'd gotten like two weeks before I'm like, I've finished it. <laughs> so, uh, was not the teacher's favorite. <laughs> so, yeah. so look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of, you know, we're, we've just been a great chat. Uh, uh, there's two more questions that I kind of want to uh, ask you here. So the first is kind of related to something that you've both been talking about. You're both phenomenally successful, uh, neurodivergent queer folk. So how do you think, uh, you know, being queer and neurodivergent has informed your outlook on, you know, life and maybe your interactions with other people specifically? Yeah. So something I want to I want to say really quickly, because I realise we've both been blowing smoke up our own asses a bit. Um, well-deserved smoke. Uh, yes incredibly but, incredibly deserved yeah. <laughs> like I do I do really want to reflect on the fact that like you know the fact that I've had all these opportunities the fact that like I have been so successful in this way is like it's both an incredible amount of luck right that my special interests have aligned for this thing I can study at uni right <laughs> like imagine if I'd just been very into home stuff which I was but I was more into genetics um, right like that aligned with the career path my passion for like data and numbers and making that all line up that aligns with the career path that's an incredible amount of luck but it's also an incredible amount of privilege right so I um I grew up in Tauranga in the North Island of New Zealand um which is Ngāti Aroha and Ngāti Ranganui um original land um but I come from like an extremely upper middle class family like Certainly my parents both grew up on farms, but dad was the second person in his family to go to university. Um, Mum like left school at 16 and became a journalist. And back in the day, that was all you had to do to be quite a good journalist. Um, and they had me and my brother later in life. So they had savings. They were very focused on like the value of education, very focused on books. Definitely like that pressure messed me up a little bit, but that also has like a huge element of privilege to it. It's also being a white autistic person is like that that's easier than, than being a non-white autistic person. And I want to be very clear around that as well, right? Like very successful, got a lot of privilege, really lucked out on some elements as well. Um, when it comes to like how it shaped my, my view on life, right? Like I, I don't, I've never had a different brain. <laughs> is probably the best way to put it, right? Like, I, of course I think this way. It's weird to me that other people don't think this way. Um, I think when it comes to how, like, I look at communities and things like that, it's very much I see my neurodiversity, my queerness as being sort of part and parcel of the same thing, right? Like, I, you know, when you're different in multiple ways, they all kind of, they have relationships to each other. And certainly, like, a lot of my very best friends are, like, queer neurodiverse people because they can share those experiences with me and also because we're not a huge community right like you know you have to tick a lot of boxes to sit in this one um and being able to engage with people on that level and to talk to people who just understand hyper focus and how you feel about things that are your, like I still love genetics so much um and it is, it truly is, like, the, the genes I've researched, I would still, like, I can just, like, rattle stuff off about filament A, NDFS4, and NDFS6, like, so easily, right? Like, and it's just, like, that just became so much of a passion for me. Um, but I also have to make practical decisions. And for me, that practicality was, like, again, in the sense that I've 
older parents having to get a real job (laughs) because one day they're not going to be able to work and I want to be in a position where I can support them if I need to. And that very, like, I don't know if it's a particularly autistic thing to take that very practical, like I've written a pros and cons list and now we make a decision. Um, But it's certainly like, that was my approach. I realized I kind of went all over the place there. Um, But I hope it's a bit of an answer. Yeah, Yeah, no, no, that's great. I just want to make sure that you're aware that even if your parents aren't older, they will still die. Thanks, Daphne. Oh, sorry. That's really dark. We're we're like (laughs) on a public panel. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I'm I'm gonna stop now because yeah. No, no, no. You, you, you. I mean, look, I'm all for dark humor, but you're right. There, I don't know what's going on with all any of the people who are listening here. So. Um, dark humor uh, is something I uh, um, probably doesn't I enjoy it but it probably is not appropriate coming from someone who's here in a semi-professional context no 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 you can you can we want you to bring your full self to uh, discussion which is what you both have done beautifully so thank you you have already talked about doing I will not be doing that yeah well look one of the things that has definitely been very apparent to me through my whole life is that nobody actually wants me to bring my full self it's almost always that's almost always not actually what anyone really wants Hmm. so I will not be doing that but I appreciate uh you know the um the gesture so all right so we've talked about our full selves then uh so can, can I ask as a final sort of, you know, uh, final word um, on, on how you think we can sort of better respect, appreciate and embrace neurodiversity and your thoughts on how, how it might enrich our world? I think I'll give Daphne time to think on this. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it is just being nicer to each other right? Like so many of the difficulties that I can like identify and be like, oh, this is because I am autistic. And so I didn't understand this and this was missed and this was missed. Like that'd be solved if like we were just fucking nicer to each other, right? (laughs) Giving people the benefit of the doubt, assuming incompetence rather than malice. Um, And like just being aware of like the fact that we're all people, we're all just trying to get along. I think a lot of people are much more aware of that now than they were maybe three years ago. Um, But like, genuinely like there's a lot of resources out there as to how you can make your workplace your community your space more inclusive to neurodiverse people um huge amount of organizations even in australia um but when it comes down to it just like letting people have bad days being kind to the people around you and just being like understanding that you don't have to be you don't have to interact with people if you think they're shitty or you don't like being around them. Like I've absolutely had some people and I definitely, you can speak to this if you want to as well. But like, I've had people who will just like spend so much time around me and be very obvious about the fact that they don't like me. It's like, okay, cool. Leave. Like you don't have to be here. And so that's both from like an internal perspective, but also you don't have to be in those scenarios. Right. Like, When it comes to neurodiversity, I'm increasingly of the opinion that, like, I mean, again, like, as Emma said, right, there's a lot more out of it out out there than we suspect, right? And a lot of that is due to the fact that the world in which we live is totally cooked in so many different ways, right? (laughs) Um, Did humans evolve for a nine-to-five-hour, nine-to-five workday at a desk? Don't think so. I'm not going to get into, like, evolutionary bullshit here, but it seems unlikely. And it seems like our brains are doing some weird stuff to try and cope with that. So really, like, the biggest thing you can do is extending kindness to your fellow humans. Great words. Great words to sort of leave us on there, Sophia. Thank you. What about you, Daphne? Do you have any uh, final thoughts? I don't really have uh, anything to add on top of that, I guess, you know. I mean, I think... um there's it's a big world out there you know uh and uh you can find your own niche and that's what i would encourage everyone to do and you don't have to you know exactly spend time with you know people who you can't get along with or who don't like you i would hope that people would sort of naturally find their people but sometimes it helps to know what you're looking for and so that might be somewhere also where a diagnosis is helpful I mean, I can't really comment, unfortunately, about workplaces. I work for a large and personal organization that doesn't care about me and as an individual and never will. 
nobody is ever going. And I'm at the bottom pretty much of the hierarchy. And honestly, even when I'm apparently at the top of the hierarchy, I would still be buried under a mountain of other hierarchy. So um, no one's ever going to structure a hospital or any part of a hospital in a way that considers me or suits me. And I'm never going to be able to not talk to people who don't like me because that would is literally part of my job. But, um, but you know, I've, I found my niche um, and, uh, and it's, it's pretty good, I guess. It took a while to get there. Uh, it's, but uh, once you find it, uh, you can have a pretty good life, you know? Well, those are, those are pretty good uh, words to leave us on. Definitely, that, that's pretty great, actually. Thank you. Thank you both so, so, so much uh, for um, uh, being so uh, honest. And I think there was something in the Q&A. Uh, there, there, we've had a couple of questions. I think we've covered it, yeah. We have, we have yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do now is, is actually uh, uh, throw to uh, Katriona uh, New uh, Robinson. Uh, so the lecture that we've, uh, that we've had today was produced in collaboration with the Royal Society of Victoria. Uh, and so it's a custom of RSV to move a vote of thanks at the end of a meeting uh, or a lecture. Um, and so Catriona uh, is the science comms officer uh, for RSV, and so he's going to move the vote of thanks and, and close us out, actually. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so it is a tradition for the Royal Society of Victoria to move this vote of thanks. And um, for the past few years, or past two years, it's actually been Sophia who moved the vote of thanks at the quiz and science lectures. And I feel like I have very big shoes to fill. I was saying that to Alicia. Um, so here we go. Uh, the quiz and science lectures mean so much to me, not only because I get to le learn a lot of cool science sort of things and I'm just a science nerd, so I love it, but also it provides a platform for scientists in the LGBTQIA plus community to, to shine. And the people who presented tonight are our people. Um, and, and it's so great to hear from all of you about your work and your experiences. Daphne and Sophie kept referring to finding community and your people. And I think that's what Queers and Science has done for me. It's allowed me to find my people. And I think it's the same for a lot of us here. Um, the the Queers and Science lectures was sort of how I found the group. And, and I think it is the same for a couple of other people as well that I know of. And, you know, it's just so great to have these lectures to bring us all together. The brain is such a beautiful and complex thing. And as Sarah mentioned at the start, each brain is unique and we're interacting with the world in unique ways. Um, so the various colors of the pride rainbow reflect both the immense diversity and the unity of our community. And so I think it's quite fitting that we discussed something as unique as the brain, something so diverse that no two brains are the same. But Emma also highlighted the importance of awareness and, and we have united and we have come together in this lecture to learn all about neurodiversity. So I think it's, it's quite fitting. And I just have a small thanks for each individual speaker. Sarah, thank you for your beautiful opening, explaining that all our differences in our brains are normal, not deficits. Liam, thanks for sharing how you study the complexities of, of how one neuron just is connected to thousands of others in neural networks. And it just sounds so incredibly complicated. And I'm in awe of all of you who study this. Kate, casually just justifying your work, like why I even study behavior? And I feel like I can say that because I'm, I'm friends with Kate. Um, but, but thank you for, for sharing how you use animal models to do so and, and explaining the importance of your work. Um, Emma, thanks for sharing your story from working with people who have autism from when you were 17 to now researching the challenges um, that you're currently doing, challenges that people with autism face and, and, and how that can also, you know, mean that they have certain skills and unique skills and, and how we can help them thrive, which I think is really important. Daphne, thanks for bringing your cat Pan onto the panel. I felt like I had to get that pun in there. Um, and, and also for telling us how it dawned on you why it was, or, or at least part of the reason that you felt like you were different from people around you. I think it's sort of important to reflect on that. And Sophia, thank you for sharing the importance of a diagnosis, both 
for a word to describe the inner workings of your brain, but also for that, that vindication. Um, the, the panel was really great and um, had us sort of smiling and, and nodding along a fair bit. And for those of you not privy to the host and panelist chat, there were many laughy, smiley faces in the chat. <laughs> so with all that said, I would like to move a vote of thanks to Sarah, Emma, Kate, Liam, Daphne and Sophia for, for giving us insights into neurodiversity, both in terms of how it's studied as well as the lived experiences of those who are neurodivergent. And thank you to those behind the scenes as well, especially Elisa and Manuela and the rest of the Queers in Science Committee who made this event happen. So thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everyone. So that draws this lecture to a close. So uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for giving your time. And, and we hope to see you at the next uh, Queers in Science event. Thank you.